either to start the series. Chen Yi will tell us about Fadens fear regularization of 3D CFTs. We'll be here also tomorrow and the morning. Yeah. So sure there will be more questions. In addition, we will take him to dinner tonight. So whoever is interested, please send me an email relatively early so that I can make a reservation. So uh, first of all, I'm happy to follow my patient. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to visit here. Actually, it's my first time to visit Princeton. So yeah, and uh, today uh, the topic will be this so-called Fadis Sophia regularization, which myself are uh, very excited about. So, and I will try to be pedagogical at least uh, at the beginning and uh, for people who already saw some version of this talk, hopefully in the end, I can show something new and some did, uh, and the, if you're interested in some details of our work, you can check those papers. We have already posted our archive. There actually will be another one here tomorrow uh, night about F functions of 3D icing uh, safety. Okay, so uh, let me first thank my collaborators, uh, particularly uh, Professor Wei, Wei Zhu uh, from West Lake University and his student, and also uh, Chao Han at Yang Wufu, and also a, a number of people at Perimeter Institute, including my student, Chen Zhou, and uh, Postdoc F. Huffman, and Postdoc Yi Jian Zhou, and my uh, student colleague, David Kaito, also at Weizmann Institute, uh, Johannes Hoffman. Okay, so this is the outline of this talk. I will uh, start with uh, motivation and then uh, give you an idea about what this uh, Fuzzy Sophia regularization is. And then I will uh, use uh, a very concrete example, this uh, 3D icing safety uh, to show how things work and uh, what can we do uh, with this method. And if time permits, I will uh, uh, also talk about some more recent progress about studying conformal defect using this method and also some, some emergent gauge theories. Okay, uh, so uh, I think I don't need to motivate too much that why we care about CFTs, right? Uh, for people in the room, there are different motivations, right, to study CFTs. For me, as a condensed matter person, uh, the original motivation uh, to uh, study CFTs comes from the, the quantum matter perspective where we have a lot of Interesting quantum criticalities, also gapless and liquid phases, which may describe by some uh, three dimensional or two plus one couple of field theories. Okay, so, and we know that CFT are strongly interacting, right? That is a challenging and also fascinating aspect of CFTs, right? In 2D, uh, a lot of CFTs are solvable thanks to the seminal paper uh, that uh, all of us we know. And in higher dimensions, that safety is strongly, uh, that, that safety are not that well understood. There are a number of methods that we can use to study them, like perturbative RG computations or putting on a lattice and then do some numerical simulations, mostly used for color simulations. And in recent uh, one or two decades, a very powerful method called Kampong Bootstrap, which really provides a lot of uh, non perturbative information about CFTs. But still, we need like non perturbative method that can help us to understand better about the landscape of CFTs and also the properties of CFTs. That's why uh, I'm very excited about this uh, uh, Before I go into the details, let me uh, just uh, try to get you excited by tell, uh, telling you how good this uh, Fadi Sophia uh, regularization is. Now, let me uh, contrast with the usual. Uh, so, at some level, this fuzzy sphere regularization is very similar to uh, the lattice model simulations of uh, uh, the lattice model simulations of CFTs, right? So, so let me uh, con uh, compare it with the usual lattice model simulations, like you simulate an uh, icing model on cubic lattice, for example. And there, if you want to get a good uh, knowledge of, of accurate information about uh, the CFTs, you may have to simulate a very large system size, like thousands of millions of spins, and that may take like millions of CFT hours. But using such a sphere, really uh, surprising thing is that even with very small system size, like 10-ish spins, we can get 
pretty accurate views about uh, safeties. And if that would, for example, just take like half an hour on a laptop. And even more uh, exciting uh, is that uh, using this funny sphere, we can actually get almost everything that we care about safeties. But in contrast, if you do it to some lattice model simulations, you can only access very limited information, like two or three query exponents by measuring correlators uh, of some operators. And you don't have access to uh, conformal symmetries. But in unfuzzy sphere, uh, we do get fingerprint of conformal symmetry. So that's why I'm very excited about this method. And yeah. I'm sorry, maybe you're going to discuss this later, but uh, to me, it seems like 4 to 20 spins are not going to be quite free from, say, finite size effects and so on. Yeah, but in the end, it's just finite size effect is very, very small. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you say there's still a good approximation to the infinite system. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a surprising yeah. and also mysterious part of this. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and, and the key, uh, okay. one key makes this happen is a very basic property of CRT that is called state operator correspondence. That is, if we consider a quantum version of a CRT, let's say you put the space dimensions on the sphere as d minus one, and then uh, you can have this uh, state operator correspondence, namely that the eigenstate of the quantum Hamiltonian uh, will be in one to one correspondence with CRT scaling operators, right, including primary operators and descending operators. And then the energy gap of that quantum Hamiltonian will be, uh, of those eigenstates, will be proportional to the uh, scaling dimensions of the scaling operators. And using this, you can directly extract uh, the information of the scaling operators and also you can also compute a lot of other things too. And I will show this uh, uh, later, uh, in the later part of this talk. So, and of course people know this, uh, yeah, radio quantization uh, for a while, right? You can find it on any textbook of CFT and people were thinking about making use of it to understand uh, CFTs. Right. And it was originally probably pointed out by John Carney. And uh, in 2D CF, for 2D CFT, it's very straightforward to do so. Right? You just need to consider a quantum Hamiltonian uh, defined on a circle as you draw here. Right? And then uh, you can use some numerical method to uh, diagonalize this, uh, the, the quantum Hamiltonian, and then you can get information about CFT. Right. Uh, and people have done this for many decades. But if you go to higher dimensions, then you immediately run into a trouble that is the sphere has a higher dimensional sphere has a curvature, right? So then you cannot fit a regular lattice uh, onto a sphere, right? If you insisted to do it with lattice, then you may have to put some defects uh, on, your, on your sphere, and then that may uh, eventually destroy your, uh, your, the safety you want to study at in the first place, right? Uh, and that's why in the past, there are not that many efforts trying to put CFTs on a sphere and then, uh, and then uh, simulate it uh, in work of it. So, uh, and here the recipe is that we don't try to discretize the sphere, is that we fuzzify the sphere. So in other words, what we are going to do is that we are make use of this so-called fuzzy sphere, which is an uh, uh, important object in the non-commutative geometry, and then we, we will study the, uh, and we make use of this further sphere to uh, study CFTs, and then we can uh, see those state operator correspondence and so on. And, and this uh, further sphere is indeed uh, something uh, we can as matter pieces are very familiar with. There's nothing but that we consider some, uh, some quantum ball physics that are defined on the sphere, and then we project it to the lowest number of rules. Uh, and it was actually first done by uh, Duncan Hauden uh, uh, at Princeton that uh, study quantum ball systems using this uh, uh, approach. And it's, a, it's also like uh, like one, he invented this one decade ago before the formal uh, concept of Fabrice Sophia was proposed. 
Okay, so I will explain in a minute that why this noise number level gives the fibers of fear and how to make use of it to study a uh, three dimensional uh, conformal field surface. Okay, so uh, let, let's first start with this so called non commutative geometry. So, uh, so for, to, for criticism, it's not that hard to uh, imagine what is non commutative geometry. There's nothing but that you generalize the uncertainty principle. Uh, in quantum mechanics, that is non commutivity in phase space to the non commutivity in, in real space. And uh, you won't be too surprised that it was Heisenberg's original idea that uh, to uh, come up with this uh, notion. And the original motivation for him was to uh, cure, use this non commutative geometry to cure the infamous uh, UV divergence uh, uh, in quantum field surface. And uh, he didn't write any paper on this, but he wrote this idea in a letter to his uh, former PhD student, Pius. And then this idea gets propagated to Pauli and Oppenheimer, I think. And eventually, that this became a PhD project uh, for Schneider. And he wrote down the, the first paper on this uh, non commutative fuzzy uh, <laughs> random machine of the, of the uh, quantum field series. And later uh, in the 70s and 80s, the mathematical foundation of non commutative geometry uh, was developed by Alan Connors. Okay, so that is uh, the uh, lightning for the uh, uh, introduction about non commutative geometry. And uh, so, uh, and let me give you some uh, intuition that why uh, non commutative geometry helps us to uh, study uh, uh, quantum series. At least intuitively, right? So uh, the first nice feature of non commutative geometry is that uh, it's actually Ruby finite. So uh, one way to say that is that just uh, so let's say uh, if we have non commutative geometry, right? That means my coordinates are not commuting. Right? So, so then, according to uncertainty principle, that means uh, that uh, if I'm throwing uh, degrees of freedom, like particles or quantum fields on this non commutative geometry, right? Each particle will then occupy a finite space uh, in my, let's say, 2D space. And then uh, that means that uh, I am, even I have a continuous space and only able to throw in finite number of degrees of freedom, right? That makes it UV finite. And another, and, and let me just mention that this fuzzy really means that due to the uncertainty principle, the coordinates uh, becomes not, uh, uh, we cannot precisely determine the position, uh, both, uh, both positions X and Y, that means that my coordinates or my space becomes fuzzy. So, okay. And, uh, and another nice feature of this uh, non commutative geometry is that there's no rigid lattice, right? So it's actually a continuous space. So that's really nice because I get both uh, UV finiteness and also continuous space. And then I can also use this non commutative geometry to fit curved space like Sapphire, that, uh, that, uh, which was uh, our original motivation. Right? And, but on the other hand, uh, people also find that in the end, if you do a, a quantum field theory on non commutative geometry, you don't end up with a non a quantum field theory that we want to study, the usual quantum field theory we want to study. So indeed, you get this uh, famous uh, property that called the UV ion mixing, or in, or in other words, you get some somewhat non-local theory. So there are experts here that uh, studied uh, non-commutative geometry and this UV ion mixing uh, in the past. So uh, let me uh, give you a uh, very heuristic argument of this UVI mixing, but this that's my understanding. So, sorry. so X and Y are two uh, coordinate on two directions or uh, for the sides? That, that coordinate on two directions. Two directions. Oh, okay. yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, that's no size. Okay. It's a continuous space. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's say uh, we consider a non commutative field theory. Um, on 2D uh, Euclidean, right? And then I have this X and Y not commuting, right? 
And then uh, I can kind of identify, and, and also from quantum mechanics, we know that X and KX are not commuting, right? So then we can kind of identify my coordinates, let's say Y, uh, or length scale Y, uh, coordinate, uh, uh, identify Y with uh, KX, right? And then I, I, then I will get the so-called UVI mixing. That is my UV scale. This a momentum goes to infinity to get mixed with my IR scale that the, the length scale goes to infinity. That's my uh, understanding of this UVI mixing. Because there are also other uh, much more sophisticated way of uh, uh, to observe this uh, UVI mixing. So but the, the main message is that in the past, this uh, idea of this uh, fuzzy regularization of quantum field theory doesn't uh, work as far as the quantum field theory uh, is concerned. Okay. And of course, there are also a number of other motivations to study non commutative geometry and particularly non commutative <coughs> uh, field theories in physics, right? And there are like motivations in string theory and quantum gravities. There are experts here that they studied uh, this uh, in the past. And in, in condensed matter systems, as I advertised at the beginning, that if you consider the quantum fog physics on the lowest standard level, is actually correspond to the uh, non commutative the physics on non commutative geometry. So uh, people have known this for, for a while, and there, but there are not that many papers discussing this. Uh, and the, the papers that uh, uh, talk about non commutative geometries in quantum hall physics uh, mostly were uh, thinking about using this non commutative geometry or non, non commutative field theory to study uh, quantum hall physics. And in this talk, what we are going to do is that. We want to use this uh, the, the, uh, this quantum Hall physics to guide us about how to really uh, regularize or to realize uh, quantum field series in this non commutative geometry, uh, conformal field series on this non commutative geometry. And in particular, we want to put it on sphere such that we can make use of a lot of nice properties coming from uh, safeties on the sphere. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, explain a, a little bit that why this uh, lambda levels right lead to the non commutative geometry. So the problem that uh, we are going to consider is the particles moving in a two dimensional plane and subject to a strong magnetic field uh, perpendicular to a plane as drawn here, right? And you can you can so the, the system can be described by this Lagrangian that I have a usual kinetic term. And the interaction between my uh, momentum, uh, my electrons, and uh, the, the vector potential of the uh, magnetic field. Okay, so is it, so right now we are just thinking about a single particle problem, and it's a quantum mechanical problem that we uh, learned, we solved uh, when learning uh, quantum mechanics in college, and we know that uh, this eigenstate will form the so-called lambda levels, right, and there are few. Uh, Interesting features about these lambda levels. One is that uh, the, the energy of those lambda levels will be quantized uh, with the value, uh, like uh, could be this, right? This will be proportional to the strength of the magnetic field and also will be quantized uh, according to, and the, the energy will determine, uh, depends on the label of my lambda levels. And another feature is that those. Uh, each lambda levels will be completely flat and will have massive degeneracy. And the number of degeneracy just equals to the number of magnetic flux uh, uh, you have in the system, right? And he, precisely you have, it will be equal to uh, uh, three times the area of my uh, 2D plane and over 2 pi, right? So, and then, uh, and the situation that we will consider is that we will project the system down to the lowest standard level. And then uh, if you restrict your system to the lowest standard level, because my energy band uh, and lambda level is completely flat, right? Then the kinetic energy just becomes a constant. I can then the effective Lagrangian on the lowest standard level will just take this form, and then we can quickly show that my coordinates uh, gets blocked with the momentum such that then 
I, I will have that is non-connectivity between my, my coordinates projected on the lowest number. That's how we get the non-commutative geometry. So, <coughs> so that, that's the relation between the non-commutative geometry and number levels. So as, 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 I, uh, as I said, what we are going to consider is the, the case on Sophia, right? So then uh, so we, we just modify the problem a little bit. Now I put my two-dimensional plan on the sphere, and on, in the center of the sphere, I'm placing a magnetic molecule, which plays a role of the magnetic field. Again, I'm considering uh, single particles moving uh, in the presence of this monopole. I, the, the single particle spectrum of this problem, this quantum mechanical problem, will be very similar to the previous slides. I still get those quantized uh, lambda levels, right? And whereas those quantized energies depends on the strength of my multiple flux, that is S here, and also the label of the lambda levels. And here, uh, a, an elegant uh, feature uh, is that uh, now, at each lambda orbitals, uh, sorry, at each lambda levels, the states, uh, or sometimes we call it lambda orbitals, uh, form a irreducible representation of my sphere natural three uh, rotation. Well, precisely, there will be spin n plus s uh, representation of s also. And the wave functions of those uh, uh, states on lambda levels are called <coughs> multiple harmonics. And here is an example of the uh, wave functions of lowest uh, lambda levels. And the multiple harmonics for that just take this form. Right? It's a very simple function uh, in terms of uh, my sphere coordinates. And it's actually much simpler than the spherical harmonics. So, and pictorially, those lowest lambda levels, the way, those wave functions actually are localized, Gaussian localized at different latitude of my sphere. As shown here, right? You can kind of think that the first orbitals uh, correspond to m equals to minus s and goes uh, gradually increase until m goes to s, right? That is what this uh, lowest lambda level wave function look like. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, a very important uh, ingredient in this story is that the so-called lowest lambda level projection. So, uh, and the, what we have, so in this talk, uh, for this fuzzy sphere regularization, what we are going to consider is some uh, quantum mechanical model that have fermions, uh, right, uh, that uh, interact with some interactions, right? So I can describe them using, uh, generically using some Hamiltonian like this. The first term is just the kinetic term, right? Uh, the, 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 the single, the kinetic term that I, I discussed in previous slides, like I have my fermions uh, interact with a gauge field, a, a, a static gauge field come from the molecules. And then I can consider some interactions. Uh, the interaction can take a form, for example, like this, right? So the, the model can be written in this fermionic operators, just satisfy the normal uh, uh, anti commutation relations for fermions. So then, uh, then I can just expand those fermionic uh, operator in terms of some uh, second quantized operators that, <laughs> uh, that I call C. And this uh, this uh, this uh, C there just creates states on my lambda levels. Right? It has two labels. L just labels the lambda levels. Right? And L equals to S just corresponds to N equals to zero here, I think. And M just labels the, the, the states of each lambda of toes, right? So then, uh, and then you, you just uh, mathematical rewriting that, you rewrite this fermionic operators in the continuum in terms of the, uh, the, the, the fermionic operators defined on each lambda of toes. And then uh, comes a very key step that we call lowest bundle level projection. Then I just remove all, I just keep the, uh, the the, the operators leaving on the lowest bound. Right? And this is called the lowest bound level of projection. And this projection is physical uh, in the situation that if my uh, single particle energy gap between my lowest bound level and the higher bound levels is much, much larger than my interaction strengths. And on the other hand, I'm not completely filled the states on the lowest bound level. And in this situation, 
I can always project the system onto a lowest standard level. So that, that is called lowest standard level projection. Okay, so and this lowest standard level projection with these two that are further severe. Uh, so I already like uh, in a few slides before, I already explained that why restrict your system to lowest down level is to a parking geometry. So here I'm giving you another uh, way of thinking about it that we just consider uh, a, a, a unit sphere that parameterized by these three coordinates. Now I'm projecting my system into a lowest down level. That means uh, I need to repress everything uh, in terms of uh, every physical observable uh, as a uh, a matrix uh, acting on my Hilbert space, that is the, my Hilbert space defined by the, uh, the states of lowest down levels. And then uh, those uh, coordinates then will become a matrix, uh, 2s plus 1 times 2s plus 1 matrix defined on those uh, lowest down level orbits. Then uh, you can just uh, directly compute the matrix element of each coordinates, and then we can verify that they actually uh, now those uh, projected uh, matrix uh, coordinates following this SO3 algebra, and, and then that actually uh, corresponds to the, the definition of the, 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 the fuzzy two sphere, right? And that, that's another way to say that why uh, we, we can have this lowest number level projection leads to the uh, fuzzy sphere. And one thing I would like to highlight is that if the multiple flux S goes to infinite, then uh, I'm actually recovering, recovering a continuum uh, commutative uh, sphere that uh, the coordinates are commuting and then that the radius again becomes one. Okay, so that is a relation between the uh, lowest standard level projection and the further sphere. So now uh, that let me uh, give you a uh, Concrete example about how to use this to study uh, CRTs. I will start with 3D ICT, but I can pause a little bit for questions. Can I ask a clarification question? So, so why is it you're using the sphere and not the disk, for example? What's the difference between doing a fuzzy disk? I can also have a non-compatibility yeah, yeah. geometry. Yeah. So is there something important about the fact that you have a monopole as opposed to the fuzziness itself and the non-community algebra? The reason that we do it on Sphere is because we want to uh, study Sphere, right? Uh, Sphere, Sphere is a conformally flat manifold that I can, I can have a lot. I know what CFT would look like uh, on Sphere. But on this, then it's not conformally flat, so we don't. What about a torus? Torus is flat. Hmm? It's not conformally flat. No, no, torus is flat, but the sphere has advantage to see. Energy levels on the sphere are the operator dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for studying a CFT, presumably that's convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just <laughs> if you want to study the disk, that's great, but then you have to pick a boundary condition. Yeah, yeah. You're not just studying the theory, right, you're studying yeah. theory with yeah. the boundary condition. But typically you put an infinity in the disk because you solve in the disk. Not when you're doing numerical work. Yeah, but then the Hilbert space is, is infinitely large, right? We cannot simulate it numerically. You can study yeah, analytically. Yeah. Not you. Yeah. You can fix, you know, the radius. I mean, the wave function. Yeah, yeah. The but then you do need to specify boundary condition. Yes. Well, well. But again, you put everything, you know, at infinity, and you know, there is something that decays. I mean, you put a radius and you fix the flex, you know, in that radius, and you define the infinity fraction. In this way. So you don't have to put hard for you know hard boundary conditions. Yeah, yeah. You, don't need you need to put some boundary conditions. And then the boundary conditions, conditions are fixed by the feeling fraction. So you put the functions that decay at infinity, and then you say, I will put this radius because even a number of particles and this radius, I fix I for, fix the density. For his application, if it worked, you'd be studying the CFT with some boundary condition. That would depend on your feeling fractions. Probably, yes. And he just wants to study the CFT before worrying about possible boundary yeah, conditions. Yes. Also, this, in the limit that you take it to infinity, your problem will become, you'll have a continuous spectrum. Whereas he will have a finite spectrum, which is a finite, the spectrum of dimensions. 
What is true is that there is a boundary in what I'm saying. This is true. And in his case, he has no boundaries. That is exact. This is true. Yeah. And here, on Satir, I do get those nice problem like state of the correspondence. That's something I don't have in a complicated system. I have a question. So if I try to develop the Landau expansion, starting from your electron till your dove, I don't get the I4 interaction with star product. That is a point, right? Uh, but do we get actually five point interaction with star product? Uh, it, it, so at this, our model is very different from the uh, usual quantum field series. So then I don't know. It says of doing try to <laughs> treat it as some somewhat try, treat it as a quantum field theory where it gets star product. Yeah, but I guess we, for your application, you don't want to get UVIR mixing. Right, right. So I just want to study ordinary set. Yeah, ordinary set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, another thing. I mean, you're projecting into the lowest Landau depth. I mean, why not the second Landau depth, yeah. and third, and fix yeah, another? We can, I mean, we can do this. that. We can do that. Yeah. But, that's we're not okay. going to include uh, more. No, yes, we're not. Okay. It's unclear what 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 we, would we gain by including some. Uh, it's an interesting question to explore. But at the moment, we haven't looked look into that. All right. So let me uh, move to the uh, concrete examples. This three uh, D Eisen safety. So uh, let me. Uh, Again, just repeat the, 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 the basic idea of this fuzzy sphere uh, regularization. So uh, what we are going to do is that we study some quantum mechanical model uh, that eventually realize the two plus one DCFTs that we, are in, we want to study. And it's actually very similar to a lattice uh, model regularizations. So for example, if you want to study two plus one D icing, uh, on the lattice, what you can do is that you choose, let's say, a square lattice, and then on each side, you put a spin one half uh, in your system, and then you write down a Hamptonian that people sometimes call it uh, transversal icing model or quantum icing model that you have nearest neighbor icing interactions uh, between uh, spins, and then you add a transverse field, right? And we know that for this Hamptonian, as you tune the magnetic field, the strength of this transverse field H, then you can trigger a transition from a spontaneous Z2 symmetry breaking to a, a Z2 preserving state, right? The Z2 breaking will just have your spins pointing all, all pointing to up, up or down directions, and the <coughs> Z2 preserving state will just have all the spin pointing to X directions, right? And you can say that that's a ground state in the two extreme limit, H equals to zero and H equals to infinity. And in between, you may expect that there will be this two plus one the ice state. Right. And then uh, the fuzzy sphere regularization uh, is very similar that we just consider some quantum mechanical model, but this time we are going to consider a quantum mechanical model that moves on the sphere. And I have a magnetic monopole uh, placed in the center of this uh, uh, sphere, right? And the, the Hamptonian, as I have already explained, will be described by some kinetic term coming from the magnetic molecules and also some interactions. And then the key is that this model is will be a local model if you choose the interaction as a local interaction, right? We don't need to worry about locality. And the other thing is that then the game that we can play is that we can choose different type of local interaction term such that I that can realize the uh, SEPTs, right? It, th this philosophy is very similar as the lattice models, right? We design different lattice models, and those lattice models can uh, realize uh, certain SEPTs, like ISM or some other series. Oh, so information about S is built in in N and E here? Uh, so before you had- Yeah, it, it, yeah so in principle, they're, they're independent parameters. They're independent. So yeah, the information is built in this gauge field A. Okay. But in, in our case, we, we actually fix the number of electrons with the, with the flux, which I will explain in a minute. But, but I see. In, in, in principle, we can treat them as two different parameters. Thanks. 
So, so the point is that you need to find out the interaction such that you get equivalent Hamiltonian to the to the I think. Not equivalent. I guess some Hamiltonian realize the same universality. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it may not be the same as the lattice, the, the formal versions. But how to ensure it flows to the Ising CFT before doing calculations? We, the, the, we can never ensure that. Even if, if you have a lattice model, you cannot, before you're doing actual calculation, you can never make sure that. It will flow to the same universality. But there are guiding principles like symmetry and anomaly that first we can make sure they are the same. And then you need to do some work to see whether you get set piece. So, as an example, suppose instead of icing, I wanted to do the ON spin model. Yeah. We do know how to construct a quantum mechanical model. Yeah, we, 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 we know how to do that. that. Yeah. 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 But in the end, we still need to, to do some work to do the works to verify that. In the late part, I, I will briefly talk about how to realize some emergent gauge series, which in science matter remains. Okay, uh, so uh, that is a basic idea. And then uh, for, the, for the icing uh, model, uh, for the icing CFT is uh, uh, for the sphere, uh, it's actually, uh, well, uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, take this form. So, uh, so first of all, we start with some non-relative state fermions with an isospin degree of freedom, right? So this isospin, we call this isospin as spin up and spin down. This, this spin has nothing to do with my sphere rotation, has nothing to do with my magnetic field and so on. And then uh, I can use those uh, fermionic fields to uh, build a, what we call the density operators, right? It's really just, uh, looks like this. So this density operator actually just plays a role of the spins, right? Just like the spins in the previous slide on the lattice model, right? This NZ, you can see it has an icing spin, and then this NS is a transverse direction, right? So then uh, we can write down the, uh, in some interaction form, which actually looks very similar to the transverse icing model on the lattice. So we have this icing-icing interactions, Right, and the interaction form uh, takes uh, like this that have some delta potential and the Laplacian delta. And the second term will be the transverse uh, field term. It really looks very similar to that. So, so, so the C icing. is basically the radial direction sphere? Uh, it's uh, some internal degree. Oh, it's internal. It's yeah. in, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the X is the R's of the. So, and then. Uh, so then. Uh, so this Hamiltonian have a Z2 symmetry, right? Just X on this isospin degree freedom. This Z2 symmetry will become the Z2 symmetry of the Ising CFT in the end. So, uh, so that is what this Hamiltonian looks like. And, and then what we do is that we do this so-called lowest down low level projection, right? As I said, that, that is a, a valid uh, treatment as long as I have my interactions much smaller than the uh, energy gap between lambda levels. In my setup, those are just uh, two different scales. I can choose uh, uh, the actually, uh, I mean, I can choose independently uh, in this setup. And then I, I do this lowest down level projection, right? I just rewrite my all my Hamiltonian in terms of operators defined on the lowest down level flows. Uh, define, yeah. And those C are just the creation operator, right? Creation operator is state on the lowest down levels. And in the end, the Hamiltonian we are going to deal with are just defines on this lowest down orbitals. And you can kind of think those uh, lambda orbitals as each lambda orbital as one uh, lattice site. And in total, I'm going to have 2s plus one site, then fermions moving on those sites. And one very interesting feature uh, that makes it different from the lattice model is that those lattice sites actually form the spin S representation of S. That's very different from any lattice model. And then uh, by doing this, and then we can write down a uh, Hamiltonian on this uh, on lowest number level, which will typically involve like two body term and four body term coming from this direction of those. 
So your two body term is local in M. Yep. And I assume that the four body term also M doesn't spread too much. It doesn't Bec because your interaction involves these ends, and so they carry spin one. So the model, in a way, it looks in M space like a one dimensional model rather yep. than two. It, it's non local model. Yeah, I, I wish. But it's almost local, local, right? It's almost local. local. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's quasi local. That's a nice point. So initially, when you said like at the very beginning, like four spins to like twenty spins, that refers to S here. Yeah, that that refers to two S plus one. I see. Yeah, just like number of sets. Okay. Uh, let, let's take a closer look of this uh, fuzzy sphere model. So as I have explained, right, we have this. So you can just view the model as a two S plus one site from the like chain. Right. And then I build Hilbert space on this chain, right? I have. It. So we are going to consider study a situation that the number of electrons uh, will be the same as the number of sites I have. Right. So then, uh, but but I'm not completely filled the uh, variable states because at each side I can have two electrons, but because I have an actual iso spin degree freedom, I'm choosing to fill half of those uh, variable states. <laughs> So that's my uh, many body Hilbert space, right? And I can also choose to, I mean, those charge degree freedom can move on this uh, thermonic chain, meaning that I'm not asked that I'm not, well, I'm not <coughs> freezing the, the charge chains of this uh, model. Okay, so that is- Is it important to fix the total charge or if you let the charge not charge change, would it matter? Because you know, what you have is a ferromagnet, and that's yeah, yeah. the spin that's important. That is... I, I needed the charge uh, gap to be finite, such that it will decouple from my IR, my IR because I want to study a CFT with only bosonic treatment. As you're saying, if we let the charge fluctuate, you'd just be bringing in another mode, another uh, soft you, mode. So the, the, let, let me make sure, what do you mean by charge fluctuation? Well, let's say the interaction conserved charge only yeah. modulo two instead of conserving it exactly. Uh, right, so then for that, then, then the charge gap will be, uh, yeah, it will be gapless. It, it will be gapless, and that's just a different theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, here, the, the, the charge degree freedom is not completely frozen, meaning that it's not like a multi insulator, but when no, no. you have <laughs> precisely one charge sitting at each side, yeah. but here it's, the charge has free to move, but the total number is always fixed. Sorry, uh, G0 and G1 are free parameters that you can adjust? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a free parameter that we will adjust to get the sweet spot, which I will explain. So, uh, so that is my Hilbert space, and then uh, I can write, and then I, I, I will write down the Hamptonian uh, for this. Uh, so the Hamptonian will involve this four fermion term, right, which actually comes from this icing ice impressions that I showed here. And I get two body term that is just a transverse field term. And the four fermion term will uh, uh, looks like this, right? Uh, so it involves three J symbols. Uh, and pictorially, you can easily understand, you can easily understand this uh, four fermion impressions. You can think of it as some scattering process because each fermions will be a spin S uh, wrap of my SO3, and then I sketch two uh, fermions, they can exchange as some intermediate angular momentum channel, this 2S minus L, and then this uh, different choice of L can give me different uh, interactions. This uh, will be a free parameter that called VL, and this is called how dense to the potential. And for, the, for this uh, choice of this potential, Delta and the Laplacian delta in the end will correspond to V0 and V1 that we can uh, strip, straightforward the uh, work out. So that's the Hamptonian that we want to play with. So as you can see, this Hamptonian is actually all to all uh, interaction, right? Although it's a 1D spin, 1D chain, but the Hamptonian is, is non local, it's all to all interactions. If you look at the, the, the magnitude of the strain, the magnitude of each term, you will find actually it's. Decays exponentially, but there, uh, 
but still it's not like a local model, it's quasi local in the sense that uh, for, for two sides, what is uh, whose range is uh, is around root s, it will be finite. That's why it's quasi local. For a local model, the, 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 the range of interaction will be one. Can we think of this chain as the different lines of different latitudes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Each side will pictorial just and you don't localize. have periodic boundary conditions. No, there. no. Is no. But because on each line just one spin. Oh, but it's not just the one if the north pole is the same yeah. as the one in the south pole. Oh, 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 it should be it should cover yeah, the sphere. Yeah. yeah. And and they as I emphasized several times, those sides forms a uh, spin S representation of the atmosphere. Then it cannot be purity. So writing it as a spin chain, the SO3 symmetry is still there, but it's not obvious in this way of writing it. But it's there. You write it as a the, chain. In the in the Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. The Hamiltonian is SO3, right? That's all. Yeah. It follows the yeah. why is that the first hot density the potential is the only thing that appears here? We have two hot potentials. Well, you have G0, G1. I mean, the Laplacian is the first half, the other is a constant. We have V0 and V1? No, and V1. I understand. I understand. I mean, V0 and V1 in combination of G0 and G1. Yeah, so yeah. U has a delta function and then the Laplacian. Yeah, yeah. These are essentially up to the first half days of the potential. Uh, so, could you repeat the last sentence? The Laplacian of the delta is the first half days of the potential. So the potential, in principle, is expanded. Yeah, the, 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 the delta potential is the first. Well, you call it zero or whatever. I mean, here yeah. for 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 bosons, but not for fermions. No, no, no. Uh, so yeah, if you consider uh, fermions with no actual degree of freedom, then V zero vanishes. But here I do have an iso spin degree of freedom. Then V zero is fine. I understand, but my question is, why is that you have to stop until what we call La Flasha? It's completely yeah, the first or second or whatever. Why? Yeah. yeah. yeah Why? If you have an increased war, should the potential yeah, yeah, more? We can. We can. Do you gain something? Or yeah. just, what do you gain? I mean, I'm asking. So in what in is... principle, we, we can gain something by doing enough fine tuning, but at the moment, we, we don't. You can, you can think that if you add more interactions, that's like you, you give you more, uh, you can fine tune more irrelevant perturbations. Then you can kill more irrelevant perturbations and make them just that it converges faster. But we haven't done so. That would be a very interesting direction to pursue. By the way, the first Hamiltonian is a Hamiltonian of a paving Hamiltonian, um, where you are changing the size, the, the angular momentum of each uh, over there. I mean, if you, put, if you put the thing differently, of course, you are trying to emphasize the SOP3. It's simple. That's the whole point, but this Hamiltonian is a pairing Hamiltonian. Yes, pairing, can... pairing, superconducting, pairing. Okay, of course, Anderson pseudo spin. Yeah, exactly. Spin. So yeah. this is Anderson pseudo spin. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So, it's yeah. the same. Um, Maybe we can perhaps go back on yeah, the two, which is two interpretations. Yeah. So, Doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's condensed matter jargon. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm here for now. So what's the VL for S minus 12? So how is that related to G0, G1? G0, I, I remember in the previous slide, G0, G1 has any parameter you put, you put into your- Yeah, the V0, V1. Right? Uh, so you only have a V0 and a V1, and there's no higher V no. in that sum? No. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. If you- Oh, so oh I see. I actually don't understand all these questions. Isn't that the same as when you write the transverse field Heising model? You declare the symmetry and you write some operators and then you scan the coefficients. And you can always add more, more terms and look for more. Yeah. He's hunting for the critical point. And if you can find the critical point in this space, that's wonderful. If you throw in more parameters, yeah. you can to serve. I'm not, I'm other not the same with the philosophy. <laughs> no, but I don't see why, why the emphasis on other terms that you could have added. It's quite clear that you have enough parameters to find the critical point. The point is that adding more interaction changes. I mean, 
If you want more interactions, you are changing, for example, if you want to describe, for example, a fractional, he has a, like a fractional quantum fluid kind of thing, right? Because you are not feeling. So the whole thing. So if you want to stabilize, if you want to have an incompressible fluid, I mean, there was a question about gapless or non gapless here. Okay, so those Hamiltonians will have gap, incompressible gap, for very particular things. Of course, he's making finite. Because he's making these things finite. You are not making infinite. Okay. But 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 the gap or no gap depends on how many things you add and what is the reason, what is the condition. Well for fractional fluid, yeah. yes, but yeah. then consider integer fluid. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. So you only consider my understanding is he's doing a quantum mechanical system with a fixed number of particles yeah. and this is Z2 symmetry, and he has enough parameters to hunt for a fixed point. That's what he's doing. Yeah. And by adding more parameters, yeah. it will open the fixed point being some co-dimension one in the space of couplings. Okay. It might convert faster or things like that. You might find multi-critical points, but that's more that's for the advanced class. <laughs> <laughs> and more terms you like you add a second neighbor, third neighbor, cross neighbor. You don't want to do that. All right, so uh, so then uh, this is my phase diagram, right? I have two independent tuning parameters, like the ratio between B0 and B1, the other is the channel field uh, B1. So I will have two phases. Uh, one is icing paramagnet, the other is paramagnet. It's very easy to visualize those two uh, different phases, right? Both phases, uh, I mean, you can just think of a product state uh, for both phases. So then uh, the product state will have one electrons uh, at each orbital uh, precisely. And then uh, the spin, the iso spin degree freedom can break the Z2 symmetry uh, that corresponds to Ison permanent. And you can also have a paramagnet that the iso spin points to the X direction, right? That preserves the Z2 symmetry. And then in between, uh, you may expect that two, uh, two plus one uh, Ison transitions. So that is uh, uh, the, the phase diagram that we obtain from uh, numerics. And then uh, what we find is that if we move on this uh, 1D critical line, we will find a sweet spot. Uh, and then at this sweet spot, we find that the, the fine size of track is miraculously small. So that is what we are going to do, that just at this sweet spot, then we want to look at various properties of CFTs, including the state of the respondents and many other properties. So I can say, no, what, what is the fluctuation small at the sweet spot? The fine size of track is Oh, OK. Yeah, which we will Fine size. Yeah. So just remind you that we want to look at state of the correspondence that just look at energy gaps, right, of my excited state to, and then this, this will correspond to the scaling dimensions of the operators, right? And one thing that we need to understand uh, is the symmetry of my model, right? And uh, in, the, in, the, in my UV model, I will have a Z2 symmetry, right, which just acts as the iso spin degree freedom, and I have a severe rotation, uh, and at the on the orbitals we are for the SO3 wrap. And I have this so-called particle symmetry, which acts like this. And those three symmetries will correspond to the I think Z2 symmetry, uh, SO3 Rowan symmetry, and space-time parity symmetry. And we can uh, label uh, all my eigenstate using those three quantum numbers. And the other thing I would like to uh, emphasize is that the number of sites, uh, this 2s plus 1, uh, is my space volume. In other words, the root of n will be proportional to my radius of my sphere over some regulator and lattice space. And here, the regulator is actually the magnetic lens of my system. OK, so can we correct the yeah. space, space time. Is it parity or time reversal? Ah, uh, I think it's parity. Isn't parity included in the SO3? Parity of space. That's only SO3. Parity is like in probability. It's all You also can buy most of the side. Yeah, for that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, we can, removing that is still a symmetry. Yeah, so maybe I should remove that. 
Yeah, we can make it in the code. So uh, on the number show the first relativity analysis, your system is really time and space is better different. It's just because it's I think it's the only candidate or but uh but on the chat that's the fear what's the relativity? No, no, but you have time yeah. in conform what's the time yeah, and yeah. state, right? So the, the, you could just find the conformal symmetry is, is emergent, right? Yeah, so, so then we want to conform a point at the latest point. It's just that, then we, that, that's something we want to check. That's check. Yeah, yeah. Okay, should speed up. So, uh, so here is uh, the energy gap of system with 15 electrons. I can label all that. So th those only a very few low lying part uh, of this uh, entire spectrum. Now I can label each state using quantum numbers. C2 parity and also the SO3 angular moment x axis. And then we want to look at energy gaps, with, which will be proportional to the scaling dimension with some non universal factor. We get rid of this non universal factor. We, we, we can, for example, just uh, realize that there's a suggest tensor, which uh, was scaling dimension is always three. And then we just rescale this. this to make the energy gap to make the scaling dimension to be three. And then after this is scaling, the other uh, uh, gaps uh, will be just be the scaling dimensions up to some fine size corrections. Right? And we have this primary and descendant structure. So then uh, we can check if this conformal symmetry is emergent or not. Right? So we look at the lowest state that is a primary state that we call sigma and then Look for a conformal algebra to see if all its descendants exist, and we find it, they all exist uh, in my low line spectrums, and we remove them. And then in the remaining state, we find another primary, uh, this epsilon, and find its, all its descendants, and move them and keep on doing this. Understand so all, the, all the states in this low line spectrum. So here is some plot that uh, for the conform multiplet of my. Sigma state and epsilon state, which I just showed. And the symbol, the lines are from the conformal bootstrap results as well as the conformal symmetry. And then uh, the symbols are our numerical results for 16 electrons. And now you can see that the agreement is really great. And here is the raw data that we didn't do any fine size extrapolation. And for very high levels, there are some discrepancies, but that's something you should expect because. There always exists some irrelevant operators which will cause some fine size corrections. And those discrepancies are actually also universal uh, that you can understand using conform perturbation theory. Okay, so now let's look at numbers. Uh, so here I'm uh, listing our uh, raw data with and compared it with the conform bootstrap. And indeed, we can uh, find many uh, primary operators uh, in our low line spectrums. And we find that all the raw data actually agrees with conformal bootstrap data uh, uh, and uh, with very small error, right? And we can also go beyond the conformal bootstrap by computing some parity odd uh, primary operators. And, and even more, the, the most miraculous thing is that even we consider four electron systems where uh, the Hilbert space is very small, and here I'm listing all the energy gaps of those excited state. And now again, you find almost like all the same, all the uh, excited state correspond to a CRT state with a very small error. And among those, we indeed have six primaries. So uh, that's really uh, miraculous and also mysteries. And, uh, we don't ask them. In particular, when we think about CRT emerging in some quantum mechanical model, we would think that that's is only a low energy behavior. That means only very low line state will be CRT state, high line state will not be universal. But here it seems like almost every single state uh, uh, is CRT state. That's some, somewhat coming to you. Okay, uh, so let me quickly go through some other parts. So uh, I've talked about those states and we can also think about other things like operators, correlators and so on. So uh, a very, Important, very interesting feature 
of this fuzzy sphere regularization or non commutative uh, geometry regularization is that we actually have a continuous space, right? Uh, and as, as I have explained, all the computations are done in the orbital space, right? That's like the angular momentum space, but we can easily go back to the real space by doing this uh, lambda level version of the Fourier transform, and we can go back to the real space, we can compute any observables in real space. And a nice feature of this real of this regularization scheme is that my real, real space is continuous. So all the observables then will be continuous functions of uh, those sphere coordinates. So here is a result of the correlators. For example, we can consider two point correlators of sigma prime real operators that uh, you can say that theoretically we know what it looks like. And you can say that uh, our numerical results actually agrees with theoretical uh, prediction uh, in a very range of uh, uh, theta angle, where theta is defined like this. And then uh, and the agreement uh, becomes much, much better as I increase the system size. And uh, the highlight is really that we get a continuous functions, not just a discrete table of numbers. Uh, so uh, we get some functions in terms of a series expansion of cosine theta, and it gets truncated at some order. The, the order is actually just the sum of metrics. So uh, that is nice, and we are also compute the four-point correlators. And again, we can perform, compare with booster of data as some cosine ratios. And you can see the agreement is really uh, uh, awesome. Okay, and uh, we can compute OB Gaussians, the number of OB Gaussians, and that's also, we can also agree with bootstrap results, and we can also go beyond bootstrap, and we can also compute the so called RG monotonic uh, quantities, this F functions using entanglement entropy. I don't have time to explain, uh, and this paper, I think we just posted the paper, submit the paper to our time. So the, the key is that uh, we get uh, these f functions uh, of 3D icing. Uh, take this value, which is slightly smaller than the three scalar, consistent with that theorem, and it turns out also to be very close to the uh, the, the epsilon expansion uh, computations. So oh. maybe naive question: If you compute the entanglement entropy, is that still u bit divergent, or it's smoothly regulated? It's smoothly regulated. And it's also full of error. Okay, so let me uh, maybe uh, just one or two minutes uh, quickly uh, flash the results of critical case series and confirm defect. We can if you're interesting. We can, we can always talk about lab. So, uh, so one thing is that we can study critical case series. I don't need to introduce too much what it is. Uh, so, uh, and and so. Uh, one, uh, so uh, so in our case, at the moment, the thing we study uh, always have emergent gauge field. We don't have gauge field in the UV. So then the, we, we again study some quantum mechanical model in a very similar fashion as the IC model. And just that here we can add more flavors. For I think we just consider two flavors of fermions. Here we can consider two n flavors. And again, we write down some interactions in real space and then we project it to a low standard. Right. And we consider a case that we have two M flavors of fermions uh, uh, built. And for this type of Hamiltonian, it turns out to, uh, uh, yeah, it may potentially realize uh, several different types of critical gauge series that typically have some symplectic gauge field uh, with, with or without transcendence uh, field, coupled with some fundamental boson fermions and so on. So, uh, and, and so here is some, some preliminary results. So for, for a special choice already published, uh, it's for, this is called deconfined efficientations, but we can also play with other cases, which correspond to, for example, transcendence. So this one will have finite transcendence term. So you can see that again, we get very nice emergent conformal symmetries. So we can also study conformal defect. We probably need to skip that. So it's just, so yeah, I'll explain this. So yeah, so it turns out that the conformal defect is also very uh, easy to study. That what we need to do for one D defect, what we need to do is that just modify my Hamiltonian uh, 
a little bit at North Pole and South Pole, then we can get different uh, type of defect. And, uh, and then we can get the operator spectrums. We can also compute the so-called G functions, which is a bit like those F function at the central charges, which is much more tonic. So the G function is with a boundary. Uh, for or the, is that the G function of the defect, defect, defect right. not a boundary. Because there's a G function also with a boundary. Uh, that is called a B function. Uh, the G <laughs> for, for 3D, I think it's for, for, for the two dimensional defect, yeah, yeah. it's called B function. If you form it on defect become the G function of the boundary in the photo theory. What? If if you in the sphere, if you form the theory in the double theory, yeah, it's become the G function of the boundary. Yeah, ah, that's right. Okay. So are you computing partition function or something like entanglement and tricky? Well, we are computing something like partition function. Partition. We're actually using wave function over that. Oh, wave function, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It can also, I mean, the same method can also be used to compute the function of one, one plus one itself. Very similar to what you have the, uh, just you, you got did and you got two functions. So we got two functions. Uh, so uh, we can also study some different schemes. So I think there are a lot of things to explore uh, in this, uh, following this idea. Right? One thing is that we can just use it as a numerical tool to study CFTs, right? There are a lot of interesting open problems like critical page series and many other problems that we can just use this method to study them. And one, one thing that I have demonstrated is that it's really very powerful method that have very small fine size effect and you can compute almost everything that uh, we care about. And another, maybe even more uh, exciting direction is to understand why it works so well. So I don't, I don't know the answer. It could be that the non-commutative geometry somehow plays the, 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 the magical role here, which I, I think one thing I have already demonstrated is that this, with this non-commutative geometry, we really get nice property of UV finiteness such that we can simulate it in a computer. And meanwhile, it's a continuous, uh, I get a continuous theory, right? Meaning that all the observables will be continuous functions of my states, but it's not just, it's not like that is models. So yeah, let me just, So earlier in the talk, you were talking about UV IR coupling, but then I didn't hear about it later. Did it? Did you suppress it, or it's just not it, dangerous? Or it, it, it doesn't it? appear. And but did you suppress it intentionally, or no. you're just lucky, or do you understand why it went away? So yeah, the, yeah, I, I, I think I might be wrong. But I think one way to to think about UV IR mixing is. You can see that in the end, you get some non-local model, non-local theory in the IR, right? But here, uh, what we are doing, what we are studying is some quantum mechanical model, which is local right, in real space before lowest bound level projection, right? And this lowest bound level projection, you can see just a mathematical trick that I used to help me to draw the model. So it's important to formulate the theory first and then project Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think then, that's key? Yeah, yeah. But, but there, there should be, a better way to, to understand it. And so just write down a system on um, non commutative geometry, how we know the model is local and so on. That, that's yeah. but But just in our combination, to ensure that we are studying local. Mm -hmm. The symmetries are also different. The model that gives you UVIR mixing does not have the SO3 symmetry. It's on a plane, yeah. and it doesn't even have a fully clean symmetry. Yeah. But, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But they also study on the field theory on fundamental substitution. So it's unclear whether there, there is UVR mixing or not. There, there are different claims. Some claim was saying that the UVR mixing is, is much more mild on fundamental but there are also other claims saying that they are still UVR mixing. Well, we could uh, go to the, yeah, we can, and it's on the plane. Yeah, yeah. 
then we can derive you can introduce the other parameter the integrated fermions to see if the interaction includes star product so for this problem on the on the plan there's still no mixing right because that, that the physics should not really depend too much on the, on the geometry right so <coughs> yeah but, but i don't know how to summarize it and of star product. But that would be something interesting to look at. Yeah. Uh, so when you briefly mentioned uh, more general dimensions, can one lift this story to uh, four-dimensional? Yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, first of all, uh, since we are using lambda levels to formulate those things, uh, if one can directly generalize it to any like or space-time dimension theories, like 3D, 5D, 7D, and so on, right? So then if you want to study even space-time dimensions, there are two possible ways. One is that you can study a Euclidean theory. Right? In the, let's say if you want to study a, a Euclidean theory in, in 2D, right? Then you just using our sphere, right? Then you just use our formulation, use our model, then you consider thermal phase transition rather than quantum phase transition. Then you can also use this to study 4D theory on four sphere. And, and another, another uh, direction uh, is that you can start with a higher dimensional theory and then compactify it to lower dimension, for example, for, for 2D, for 1 plus 1D, what you can do is that you start with, with a 2 plus 1D theory, let's say if for your space time measure on a torus, and then you compare it by one direction to a, to a S1, then you can use this to study. Uh, but one of the challenges would be that if you're not in relativity, you want to keep the covariance. Yeah, yeah. Your theory is still as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I'm not entirely sure about how to set up the details, but there, there are papers discussing that's a fuzzy three sphere, just using the same idea of what I described. You start with a fuzzy four sphere and then compare it by two three sphere. Yeah, there are papers discussing this. You think how to add this order? Suppose that I want to see the 3D icing model with this order. Yeah, that I don't know. But you can do a replica theory, right? Yeah. But, or you can put disorder in your system and then, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe. So you have that space time. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> Is it possible to have super symmetry? Yes, I think so. But in, in that case, you have to consider the super symmetry on the mechanics. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, we can tell, yeah. Uh, yeah, a question related to the number of level projection. So uh, is that true if I consider not uh, I think model like a OM model or a higher spin coupling, then you need to project it to higher number level? No, no. So why do you always insist on the lowest number level? Because that's a simple situation. Uh, you, can, you can study higher number level. Nothing stops you doing that. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, but you mentioned but you don't need to trick. What is the essence of uh, your project? Because, okay, in this uh, example, I understand like when you project the lowest and level on each level, you have a spin up or spin down to fill, but that corresponds to two states in the original icing model. Yeah. Does yeah. that relate to this? So, uh, I mean, if you want to consider Owen, it will be very similar here. Like you start with uh, multiple flavor fragments. Yeah. And then you can design some Hamiltonian such that it has the same symmetry and anomaly, the same symmetry as all, and then, then doesn't have any anomaly. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you can potentially realize real picture. Right? Or okay. you can also design Hamiltonian such that semi classically, you do say you, you can realize those other things that you thought. You can always do it on lowest on level. The trick is that you add more fragments. And okay. I have a question about this. In what sense do you really have the emergent theory? You, the way I see what you put here is you put the fermions and you couple them in a particular way. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no gauge field, That's either right. input or in the out. 
Uh, in what sense do you get an emergent the, uh, yeah. QCD? Yeah, the input uh, is actually symmetry and anomaly. Right? Yeah. So we input in the same symmetry and anomaly of those QCD series, yeah. and then and then we just choose the yeah. Hamiltonian. Okay, so what you're saying is that with this symmetry and anomaly, you can yeah. find you can find this nonlinear sigma model, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is not conformal. Yeah, yeah it's not conformal for the inferior fixed point. Of right, the, but in what sense does this is this relate? You could have formulated the question Bayes theory with Fermi with this thing with these symmetries and these anomalies. Know that the nonlinear sigma model with this WCW term leads to the same. Symmetries and anomalies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No gauge fields, no calculations, no numerics, no yeah, fuzzy yeah, sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was what did the fuzzy sphere add here? Then we put this model on fuzzy sphere and then ah. simulated it to say uh, and to tune my interaction a little bit to get some kind of fixed point. That's 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 And that gets better. We may eventually we may be able to tell which CFT we have realized. At, at the moment, what we know is we have some CFT. But there's no CFT here. Uh, Did you find a fixed point in the, we, we, between these? Yeah, yeah. We, we find some, let's say we look at special, and then we say there's a conformal integer. But this, the thing that appears at the top of the slide, so yeah. SPN over something, yeah, yeah. that's not a CFT. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, you can, yeah, yeah. You, you just, yeah the, the right way to say it is that I'm real. It's, it's some model where it's the same symmetry and normally as this non model. Yeah, that's okay. that, that's no yeah. So you found a fixed point there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it might not be there in the gauge theory. Right, 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 right. So um, why why you only consider like contact interactions? Like in the potential, it's the... Yeah, we can add more potentials, just like the question you have asked, right? It's like... Second so paper, it's like paper. always like expand around the around the, 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 the contact interaction is the simplest impression of the yeah. sideways. And we find it work, then I just stop. We can of course keep on having impressions. Yeah, I have another one related to lowest long bow level. So so uh, what is the physical meaning to have a higher long bow level? Like what what does that give you extra or what do you will you loss if you do not consider say the second and long bow level? It seems like to me always the mathematical trick. You just say oh, apply this, and for other model, you just change the fermion to be you know higher moment, higher flavor fermions. Right? It sounds like yeah, yeah. What's what's the physical meaning to? Or so it's just a mathematical trick. Well, if you consider physical system like actual quantum ball systems, then you, you probably need to consider higher level models. Yeah, because you never get to the ideal situation that. Uh, Longer level gap is much larger than trees. Yeah. In that case, if you want to understand what are the phases realized in materials, then you need to well, in literature it's called longer level mixing that include higher level levels. But for, for the problem we consider here, we are only concerned with the universality of the CFT, right? For that, we can just stick with the lowest number. Uh, yeah, for, as far as the universality is concerned, it's probably we don't need higher level levels. But, but that's so the universality like, basically considers the interaction much smaller than the yeah. gap. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, okay. Yeah. So before we thank him again, let I'd like to remind you that we're going to dinner. You're all invited. Please send me an email if you're interested. Then. Let's thank him again for a very stimulating talk.